Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. We're back with uh, a second briefing. Uh, this time, in addition to Ben Rhodes, the Deputy National Security Advisor to the President for Strategic Communications. Sorry, Ben Rhodes, Special uh, Deputy National Security Advisor to the President for uh, Strategic Communications. I have uh, David Lipton, who is a Special Assistant to the President for International Economic Affairs, uh, who will uh, talk with you about, you know, there have been some, there's been stories written about what uh, developments there might be in terms of uh, uh, aid towards uh, the uh, countries in North Africa to, that are uh, in a democratic transition, uh, and uh, David can address that uh, for you. He, uh, uh, I'd also like to just, I think it's been made clear to you that this was originally we had talked about embargoing this briefing. It is now, the embargo is lifted, it is on the record, on camera. The only thing that I ask is that we don't, because uh, Ben and I are back up here again, that we, you know, Ben already did the full briefing uh, on on the, with Mike McFall on the President's bilat with Medvedev, uh, President Medvedev, uh, and, and covered a lot of ground. So let's not, let's try to keep this tight and focused. Uh, ben and I are here and can answer uh, questions that David can't, uh, but let's try to get through this uh, with uh, dispatch. And I turn this over to David. Thank you very much, Jay. I'd like to talk with you about what the G8 is uh, going to be doing here um, in Deauville on the Middle East and North Africa, which I'll occasionally refer to as MENA region. We consider the MENA, the Middle East and North Africa, part of the G8 summit to be uh, a highlight of the summit, something we feel is uh, among the most important things that will be done here. The leaders will begin the discussion of the MENA region at a dinner tonight, uh, speaking among themselves, and then have a session in the morning uh, where they are joined with leaders from the region, including uh, Prime Minister Sharaf from Egypt, Prime Minister El Sebsi from Tunisia, and Mr. Amr Musa, who is the head of the Arab League. So they'll have a chance to discuss with those leaders their plans and uh, aspirations for change in their countries and to discuss ways in which we can be helpful. The President aims to uh, work with his G8 colleagues and the leaders who are coming in to visit here to build on the vision for democratization and economic modernization that uh, in the region that he laid out in his speech on May 19th. The leaders here will discuss both pillars, uh, the political process of supporting democratic transition and governance reforms on the one hand and the economic framework for generating sustained and inclusive growth. We believe that these two pillars go hand in hand. Without economic modernization, it will be very hard for uh, governments trying to democratize to uh, show people that democracy delivers. And if there's not a d process of democratization, it will be very hard for these countries to find in their political systems a way to make the kind of changes that need to be made in their economies in order to deliver economic growth for people. So we have in mind always in um, our support for the countries in the region, uh, trying to support both activities at the same time. We expect that you will see the G8 leaders commit here to a partnership uh, with these two countries, Egypt and Tunisia, and with other countries in the region who are willing to uh, go down this same path of democratization and economic modernization, as well as with those who want to support these reforms, uh, some countries outside of the G8, some in the, uh, in the Middle Eastern region, uh, we believe will want to be supportive of all of these changes and reforms. In the partnership, we and our partners will work together to develop an economic agenda to uh, pursue these objectives. And let me talk a little about the, how we see the challenges that the countries face in the economic area and how the uh, uh, efforts of this partnership, uh, reflecting what the President laid out last uh, week, uh, will be uh, crafted to try to respond uh, to those challenges. In the short run, the task is to support economic stability. These countries all had very positive, well, these two countries, Egypt and Tunisia, had very positive economic outlooks uh, before the uprisings. These were countries that were growing. 
these were countries that attracted uh, some foreign direct investment. The growth wasn't satisfactory in that it was not very inclusive, uh, but these were uh, growing countries. But now, through the disruptions that came along with the uprising, with the uncertainties about the future, especially the process of uh, elections that are being crafted in both countries, and with the, some of the uh, spending that uh, countries are doing to support their populations uh, so that the aspirations of the people are beginning to be uh, taken account of, we're seeing growth slow, budget deficits rise, in the case of Egypt, some foreign exchange reserves being lost. And we and the countries both see the, the very high priority of keeping the country stable so that the backdrop for democratization is one of economic stability rather than instability and chaos. So we've called upon, and the, the uh, G8, we expect the G8 to call upon the IMF to respond in helping countries shape a set of economic, uh, economic policies to stave off uh, any of these uh, financial problems. We ex will call upon the multilateral development banks, the World Bank, the African Development Bank also to play a role. And we call upon uh, friends in the region uh, to provide finance also to help support uh, uh, stability. Now, while we expect, we, we believe that uh, the uh, International Monetary Fund and the MDBs will play the principal role in, um, uh, st in supporting stabilization, that is the typical thing that the IMF does. When a country, a member country in the IMF is having uh, economic problems and is at risk of destabilization, the IMF can be uh, uh, supportive in two ways. They help the country devise budgetary and uh, 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 budgetary policies and policies that affect their uh, trade situation in order to, uh, over time, make sure that uh, th there's manageable debt situation, manageable um, uh, current account uh, imbalances, and stable currencies. And then to support those uh, reformed policies, they provide loans. And we would hope that alongside of the IMF, there would be loans from uh, countries in the region uh, to be supportive of those IMF efforts. So while we expect that the IMF uh, approach uh, will take care of the problem of stabilization in the short run, that, that Egypt and Tunisia face in the short run. Uh, we also uh, are willing to play a role ourselves. The President laid out in his um, uh, speech last week that uh, the U.S. will provide uh, some debt relief in the form of a debt swap. Uh, that comes in, 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 uh, in uh, to the tune of a, uh, we will ask Congress to support the uh, appropriation that's required to allow us to relieve Egypt of a uh, billion dollars worth of its debt service to the United States. We expect that that would come over a period of three years. It would be um, uh, in support, therefore, of democratically elected governments over the uh, next period. Um, and what we would do is instead of Egypt repaying us the dollars that they owe, we would relieve them of that burden, but instead ask them to swap those obligations and put some local currency into a fund that could be used domestically for a mutually agreed upon set of um, uh, purposes. We, we will be looking at ways to design that so that it is supportive of job creation and therefore of inclusive growth uh, in Egypt. We, we also, the President also announced uh, a billion dollar loan guarantee. That would be something uh, provided by uh, OPEC uh, which does, uh, is in the business of providing such guarantees. And it would help Egypt at this time when it's difficult for them to access international capital markets and at a time when their borrowing costs are elevated because of the uncertainties around Egypt's economy. It would help them borrow at a more reasonable cost and fund some of the expenditures that uh, they have at this uh, difficult uh, time. And we would hope that, that we will structure that so it is uh, helping them to finance uh, their infrastructure uh, budget. OPIC will also uh, provide $2 billion in uh, investment guarantees for 
uh, private and public-private partnerships in the region. Now, those were things that the President announced. We expect that uh, uh, in the course of uh, uh, this weekend that uh, the Europeans uh, will uh, themselves uh, answer the call that the President has made for others to join us in helping the region. The European Commission uh, launched uh, a, a, um, a new effort yesterday, and I suspect that the, uh, their leaders will be explaining some of the details of that here in the meetings, where they have, they have said that they will increase uh, their uh, spending over the period 2011 to 2013 in what they call their neighborhood policy, which includes Central Europe and the Mediterranean, by one and a quarter billion euros. Uh, and that in addition to that, that the European Investment Bank, which is a, a public sector pan-European uh, institution, would provide a uh, billion dollars for investment in the region over that uh, same time period. So we feel as though our uh, efforts are being um, uh, echoed now by our uh, European partners. And all of this will help uh, strengthen the um, uh, stability of Egypt and Tunisia uh, something that we think is important. Now, in the longer run, the task is to build economic opportunity. As I said before, the, while Egypt has, has grown, Egypt's growth has been over 5% on average for the last 15 years. But there's certainly a sense in the country that uh, the reforms that led to that growth have really not benefited the population very broadly. That's because it's a country that has a very controlled and state-oriented economy with controls and trade protectionism that um, led to uh, the sense that the uh, elites were able to be the main beneficiaries of growth. The economics of the situation was that state-controlled and state-dominated industry tend not to create many jobs because they're only producing for a domestic economy that has limited purchasing power at any point in time. Uh, Egypt, uh, to maintain those uh, state industries, has had a, a very protectionist uh, international trade regime in the ranking of 139 uh, uh, countries uh, of, uh, from least protectionist to most protectionist. Egypt ranks 118th. Uh, the lack of having this competitive environment where, a country, where the country can uh, trade has led to uh, in a, in, has led to very high youth unemployment, very high unemployment, and that uh, has fed the, the disenchantment that led to uh, uh, this uprising. More broadly across, this is a problem broadly across the region where uh, there are four million young people who enter the labor force every year. So we want to see a, a, a program of economic modernization that brings down the controls on, um, uh, that, that protects state and uh, elite-run industry and opens up the economy to uh, competition and trade so that there can be job creation, job creation in small enterprises, job creation in enterprises that are set up by foreign direct investors. Now, the way that we hope to foster that, as the President laid out in his speech, is, through mobilize, is mainly through multilateral efforts, mobilizing the efforts of the multilateral development banks, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, but also we are, the President called for, and I think we will see the uh, G8 uh, uh, get behind an effort to refocus the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development so that it can devote some of its present resource base to uh, helping Egypt in the short run. Egypt is already a member, a non-borrowing member of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. We aim to change that and to channel some funds uh, to helping uh, Egypt, but in time to turn the EBRD into a bank for uh, transition in a broader region so that the bank w can be supportive of uh, reforms in uh, the Middle East and North Africa as it was in Central Europe. This is a bank that has in its mandate the support for democratization. It is the only one of the international financial institutions that has that mandate. It has a staff that is oriented towards investment and private sector, uh, private sector creation, job creation, and private sector development. 
So we think it is the right institution uh, for that job. Now another manifestation, as I mentioned, another manifestation of the misdevelopment of countries in the Middle East is the lack of openness to trade. The region has very little non-oil trade. Obviously some of the countries are ma mainly oil exporters, but countries like Egypt and Tunisia are not. When you look across uh, the region, it has the least amount of exports uh, to uh, non-oil exports of any region in the world. In fact, the non-oil exports of this entire region of 400, of 20 countries with 400 million people are, are about the same as the exports of Switzerland, a country of 8 million people. And moreover, this region doesn't trade with one another. There are very rich uh, uh, oil producing countries who could be buying things from uh, non-oil producing countries if the two uh, parts of the region were integrated. President Obama explained in his speech that, he'll, that, that we, the United States, will launch a trade and investment partnership with those who are willing to democratize, reform, and open up. I think you will see, we expect to see the G8 sharing in this, uh, sharing with us this commitment and uh, the European Union speaking about what it can do in its neighborhood through its neighborhood policies uh, to uh, create a greater integration or to offer a greater integration between Europe and, uh, in the first instance, Egypt and Tunisia, but in time, countries that are willing to go down the path of democratization and economic modernization. The European, getting Europe on board with this approach is extremely important because of the proximity of the region to Europe. Uh, Europe is a very natural trade partner for the countries in uh, North Africa. So we see engagement as a long-run job. We expect that there'll be fits and starts along the way. Uh, we know that it's the people of the region who will choose the path uh, that they want to go down, the way in which they want to democratize and bring about economic modernization. But what we've aimed to do and what uh, I think you'll see the G8 trying to do is to light up that path for them, offering cooperation and support uh, for those who want to go in a sensible direction. Let me stop with those comments and uh, see if you want to add anything. Uh, yeah, no, go ahead, Let's just go ahead and uh, head to questions. Uh, Jeff. Uh, thank you. Two questions. Two questions. The first one for you, sir. It's, it's not, I understand a lot of what you reviewed just now came from the President's speech last week. Can you just be very succinct and clear as to what you're asking the other G8 partners to do? whether with, it, with regard to money or with regard to support. And second, a separate question, Ben, um, do you guys have a reaction to Libya's latest ceasefire offer? Thank you. First, this, the, um, the, the G8 meeting of leaders we don't see as a money pledging session. Uh, we hope in this, uh, in this encounter, uh, first, when the leaders uh, meet together without the, without the Middle Eastern leaders, to try to get people to share the vision that we have and the approach that we have, which is to understand the emphasis that has to be put on stabilization, to back uh, the IMF uh, providing substantial amounts of money. And you know, the Egyptians are saying they need $12 billion in the, in the first year of their stabilization effort. We don't know if that number is right. That's a, a number the Egyptians have put forward. But to task the IMF to help uh, Egypt and if Tunisia wants help to, to help them with uh, strong front-loaded uh, uh, programs of support for reform. We want to see the, uh, as I said, the uh, other G8 countries join us also in the vision of supporting economic modernization and opening up. Uh, and there will be, there will be, we think, important parts, most important parts of, of that will be also multilateral. So we will need uh, an effort that the, where the Europeans are absolutely crucial to reorient the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development because they are major shareholders there and to make a change in the mandate uh, requires supermajority of votes. Uh, in the trade area, of course, trade is bilateral. And uh, for us, it's something for us, for USTR to undertake. But for Europe, it requires the collective action of the European Union uh, to do. And so having a discussion among the Europeans about that all-important subject, uh, I think, is, is uh, key. 
you know, in the meetings with the um, uh, prime ministers of Egypt and Tunisia and the head of the Arab League, we hope to hear uh, from leaders how they have mapped out the uh, process of democratization and how they see the economic challenges so that we can try to devise uh, approaches in, in time that uh, will, will, will respond to their uh, circumstances. Now, on the money, while, while this meeting is not about pledging, we are setting in motion here a process that will address the financial questions, the, the ones that you asked. Uh, there will be in the, I, I believe that we will see uh, a, setting, a, set, a schedule set out for foreign ministers, for finance ministers uh, of this partnership uh, to meet in the course of the summer and the fall uh, in order to uh, take up the specific question, what are the financial needs for stabilization, for economic modernization, uh, what role can be played uh, multilaterally by the international financial institutions, and how will we mobilize uh, additional support, including from the uh, countries in the region uh, who have the resources, to, the resources to play a role and have a distinct interest in uh, the stability of uh, their neighboring countries. Yeah. I'd, uh, um, to your other question, but uh, first, you know, I, I, I think it's important to think about uh, what, what the G8 does to catalyze action. Um, I think there's several points to it. Number one, the G8 can serve as a forum to underscore uh, the commitment uh, of an important uh, segment of the international community to an issue. Uh, we're sending a powerful signal to the region um, that we can help in this one specific area, um, economic stabilization and growth, uh, that's going to be fundamental to consolidating democracies. So number one, it's sending that message. Number two, it is catalyzing um, some action. You know, we announced uh, the uh, billion dollars in, in debt swaps, the additional uh, investment uh, uh, resources associated with uh, OPEC, uh, and other efforts in the President's speech, the European, um, uh, the European uh, Commission, of course, made the announcements that David referred to uh, around its own commitment of resources. So I think the G8 serves to help catalyze that action um, and, and uh, serves as a place uh, for nations to kind of put their commitments uh, on the table, and that's what the U.S. and the uh, Europeans uh, have done here in advance of uh, tomorrow's meetings. And then third, uh, it's to agree upon a plan of action. Um, and to stake out the course that can be taken going forward to get the resources um, to the Egyptians and the Tunisians uh, and to do so in a way that um, makes sure that their economies are reforming and modernizing and we can use the unique expertise and resources um, and experiences of the uh, G8 members and of course uh, broader uh, European allies uh, and partners um, to support that. Um, so, you know, again, it's a clear message. Um, it catalyzes resources um, and it lays out an action plan um, and I think that uh, is going to do a substantial amount to uh, help consolidate democratic gains with economic growth. On the Libya question, we've said repeatedly that proposals um, from the uh, Qaddafi regime um, are not credible um, unless um, they uh, take actions. Uh, there have been, you know, they've put forward all kinds of proposals, but we still see their, uh, we still see their forces um, uh, again, uh, in, in a mode of uh, uh, attacking uh, population centers. Uh, we still see the troops out of the barracks. Um, so um, again, a proposal itself is not going to cut it. Um, uh, they know exactly what is in that UN Security Council resolution. They're not complying with it. Um, and, 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 and therefore, uh, we're going to continue to be engaged in the effort that we're uh, pursuing with our coalition partners. Chip? Uh, could you talk about the President's leadership role in this? Would this, would the Egypt and Tunisia plan be a major issue at this summit if the president hadn't pushed it? How aggressively is he lobbying this, and where does it rank on his list of priorities? You, you know, I think that um, this is something, actually, that the president um, consulted with and has had conversations with a number of his counterpart, counterparts about for some time. I think that when the president and European leaders began to look at where can we make a difference, you know, we can obviously, in the immediate term, uh, through tools like sanctions and other means, uh, try to affect transitions. But when it comes to investing in democratic success, where can we make a difference? Um, the president identified uh, the economic space as one where the U.S. and Europe were uniquely uh, capable of providing expertise, resources, partnership um, that could, again, consolidate democratic gains through economic growth. And this grew out of 
uh, the transitions that we studied, and a lot of you asked us about this, and uh, one of the things we learned in reviewing democratic transitions in the past is um, those nations that are successful almost always needed to have uh, some kind of expanded and broader-based prosperity to show that democracy delivers for its citizens. So this is something that the president was very focused on as we uh, prepared for both these meetings and the speech he gave. I think a number of other European leaders shared the view as well. Um, it's certainly been uh, the case for um, the European uh, members of the G8 who are here today. So I think there was a collective recognition. I think what the president also was able to do uh, in advance of the G8 is to put forward in a public way um, the set of ideas that we think are most important to this, um, whether it's around um, debt relief, uh, debt swaps, trade and investment, uh, reorienting some of the uh, resources of, of the European Reconstruction Development Bank, uh, and a, a long-term vision of uh, trade uh, and investment integration in the region with the, uh, the United States and our European allies. So last week, I think what he did is lay out, here's, here's the path as I see it, here's the vision as I see it, here are the steps the United States is going to put on the table and the commitments that we're going to make, um, and, uh, knowing that we're going to be coming together here at the G8 um, to catalyze this. And in terms of our priorities, you know, the President said it's a top priority in his speech to support democratic, the success of democratic change in the region. And we believe that this is a fundamental pillar of how you support that democratic success. Because statements are important, uh, diplomacy is important, um, but in the long run, democracy has to have concrete benefits for people. And this is uh, the clearest way to ensure that um, those concrete benefits follow uh, from democratic uh, transition. Julie? in the U.S. and with your European partners about what happens to the assets that you're going to give to Tunisia and Egypt if the democratic transitions there don't take hold, if the elections don't go the way you think they're going to go, or if they don't happen at all? The President made clear in, this, in his speech that our support would depend upon countries going forward with democratization and economic modernization. Now, you know, in the U.S. we have various ways to uh, examine bilateral support to make sure that uh, th those, those, con those conditions will be, those si th that situation will be satisfactory. The International Monetary Fund has uh, a different set of uh, procedures. They lend uh, in installments as uh, the reforms that they've agreed upon with the country uh, progress. And uh, so, of course, uh, the, the, there, there won't be programs unless there's an agreement on a path forward, and then there won't be a continuation of financial support over time unless there's continued progress along, along the path. So it's a kind of a graduated uh, uh, approach, uh, help for, help for self-help uh, calibrated along a path. I'd just say one more thing, Julie, because uh, it's exactly the right question. You know, first, uh, there are the steps that these countries are going to be taking, and again, uh, this, uh, this type of assistance and these types of programs um, are meant to reinforce that. But also, it's meant to create an incentive for other countries, right? So if you have governments who are considering democratic reforms, uh, you have citizens uh, who are considering whether to continue to pursue uh, their rights and aspirations, if they can see positive models, uh, it shows that there's an incentive to get behind democracy, that you can have a relationship, a trade and investment relationship, a relationship with the international community that delivers for your citizens if you move to democracy. So it's both a program of support for Egypt and Tunisia, but it's also a, a message to the broader region uh, that democracy delivers. Uh, and then if you pursue that path, um, there's going to be support on the other end. Um, and you know, that's why I think it's so important to send that signal, um, because it's relevant not just to those two countries, but to all the countries in the region. Carol. Um, given the role that you guys are asking the IMF to take in this, um, this effort, do you think it's important that the European leadership remains at, in the IMF? I mean, if, if the IMF and other European institutions are, are getting this mandate, does it make sense to say Mexico take over, or, or do you think that, that it makes more sense to leave it in European hands? I think, you know, as we've said, um, it's uh, the best person for the job, and uh, we want someone who's uh, well qualified, uh, ready to meet the challenges uh, that, that we face, uh, and we're supportive of the uh, IMF's efforts uh, and, and, and different nations' efforts to, to identify that person. Um, and, and I'll also say that you know, the IMF continues to um, play a, a fundamental role here, 
um, as, a, as an institution that is capable of dealing with this type of fundamental stabilization. But I, you know, I don't think it would affect um, uh, the calculus in terms of nationality. I didn't mention it because uh, it's outside of the uh, Middle East North Africa session, but there will be a, a session on Africa on the second day of the summit, uh, a meeting with uh, a group of African leaders. And in preparation for that session, uh, work has been done on accountability. And for the first time, we have uh, paired reports, a report by donor countries but also a report by uh, African countries that was put together by uh, NEPAD, the African group of African countries pursuing uh, development. And I think what you'll see in there, this, this year's uh, accountability report focus, uh, focuses on global health and food security. And you'll see in there both uh, numbers that show uh, country by country uh, the uh, performance of G8 countries in fulfilling their obligations. Uh, and you'll see um, uh, the aggregate for the G8. Um, you know, the United States, you will see, has uh, done what it said it was going to do. The record, more generally, is a bit mixed. Uh, we certainly uh, aim for this accountability exercise to be one that allows people to see uh, how uh, uh, commitments are, are carried through, and, and we think that that's important. Uh, you know, right now, we're, we're talking Principally, when we talk about the Middle East and North Africa, we're talking principally about uh, multilateral funding, so it wouldn't be quite the same. But certainly, we, cer we, we, you know, we believe that we should be serious about the commitments that we make. Uh, they can be conditional, as we were just, uh, as we were just uh, suggesting, and, and we think that's appropriate in the case of the Middle East, uh, but we want to see uh, countries follow, follow through. Ago, and it doesn't go as far as calling on uh, Bashar al-Assad to choose between leading a transition or uh, being out of the way. Uh, well, I, you know, I wouldn't comment on the communique um, before it's out, but uh, what I will say um, is that there is, uh, you know, there's broad agreement certainly among the United States, the European Union, um, and uh, our European allies um, about the need to ramp up pressure on Bashar Assad, uh, they need to build out our sanctions, and we've we've done that alongside the European Union um, to designate more individuals around Bashar Assad to designate Bashar Assad himself, as uh, we did recently. Um, and so I think there is a unified position in terms of sending a clear message that uh, again, if he continues down the path of crackdown, we're going to continue to escalate uh, the pressure that we can apply, um, particularly through those uh, focused um, sanctions. Um, and uh, that he has, a message, uh, he has a message that he's receiving from his own people, which is he can either lead a democratic transition or he can leave. And um, so that's certainly the, the, the uniform, uh, um, certainly the view of the United States and it's a position that is held by um, uh, our European allies um, in terms of the actions that they've taken on the accountability side uh, and the messages uh, that we've all sent through our, through our words. And it's also served, I think, in some respects to isolate Syria also in some international fora, um, uh, the Human Rights Council, for instance. Um, so you know, it's something we're gonna, it, that it will be a focus of conversation, I'm sure, at the bilateral with President Sarkozy and in the meetings tomorrow. Uh, and then we'll have the communique at the end of the meetings. I will just do, uh, if I could, just two more chops and out. Are, are, you, uh, ask, are you trying to get more support from all of the G8 countries for the President's vision on the Middle East peace process, specifically the 67 borders sort of hoping for similar statements like you got from Cameron yesterday, one. Two, um, are you guys gonna announce where the U.S. is hosting the G8 before we leave here? Um, on the first question, um, you know, we believe it's very important to have those expressions of support. Um, you know, principally, uh, the most um, uh, important one out of the box was from the quartet, um, which is we see as kind of the principal catalyst for international support for uh, peace. 
um, you know, the quartet, of course, including our European allies, the United Nations, and Russia. Um, and the quartet put out a very strong statement expressing full support for the President's vision uh, as a basis for negotiations. Uh, and then coming in behind that, um, I think, you know, you, Prime Minister Cameron made a very strong statement uh, about the importance of the President's speech um, and how it is, again, a basis for negotiations. You know, we believe that will be a topic of conversation with President Sarkozy, of course, uh, as well, who's taken an active interest in Middle East peace, um, and that there'll be discussions kind of on the margins. Middle East peace is not an agenda item uh, at the G8, um, but so it'll come up in those discussions on the margins. But uh, we think it's important uh, that the, uh, the international community um, speak uh, very, uh, in a very clear way um, about the path uh, towards peace, about the role that it can play to get the parties back to the table, uh, to address some of the uh, outstanding concerns um, associated with that effort. Um, and it's certainly going to be uh, something that we build upon from the quartet statement, Prime Minister Cameron's statement, and the discussions we have tomorrow. Alex, what about the uh, location? Oh, location. Uh, we have no, we yeah. don't intend to announce that uh, during this uh, summit. Yeah. Alex? Can I clarify the, the sums that you mentioned? It's about $2 billion for the U.S., $2 billion for OPEC, a couple of billion from the European Commission and the European Bank. Back over. Yeah. The President? I got this. The President announced uh, a $1 billion debt swap that will relieve Egypt of a billion dollars of debt obligations, a $1 billion loan guarantee program that will be financed by, uh, provided by OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Um, those are both for Egypt and $2 billion of investment guarantees that can be for private or public-private partnership investments for the region, but they will be largely in um, Egypt and Tunisia. Um, Did you want to talk about the EC numbers as well? Yeah. Okay. Then the EC, um, Lady Ashton made an announcement yesterday that they have a, um, a program that is for the neighborhood countries, Central Europe and the Southern Mediterranean, that already had certain amounts of money scheduled for the period 2011 to 2013. And that what they've indicated is an intention to increase that amount by one and a quarter billion euro. euro. Um, and that's money to be sp that they intend to spend over the period 2011 to 2013, now some of it will be in Central Europe, but they intend now with what's going on in the Middle East to have heavy emphasis on, the middle, on uh, North Africa. They've also announced that the European Investment Bank, which is a public institution, a pan-European institution, will increase the amount of its investments in North Africa by a billion euro. And when will money start getting to these countries? And so do you have a total sum that you're looking for? How much, do you have a round figure of what you're looking for? <laughs> Well, the truth is that the total sum is something that awaits some discussion between, in the case of Egypt, Egypt and the IMF. One has to understand the scope of the stabilization challenge in order to do that. Um, and then the, the, the multilateral piece will be determined and the bilateral piece is added to it. So I think that it's premature to, to, to talk about uh, uh, a, a total amount with a year-by-year -year, um, phasing, but this will be refined in the course of the coming uh, couple of months. There'll be, as I said, there'll be a uh, finance ministry um, uh, group that will discuss this, and finance ministers themselves will discuss it uh, when they next meet. Uh, and at that, by that point, the IMF uh, action plan will have been uh, uh, refined, and uh, the bilateral, uh, how the bilateral monies fit in with that will be refined, but we don't really have that yet. Um, we'll have, I mean, the Tunisian Prime Minister will be here tomorrow. He may, but he has not yet. Thank you all very much.